Well, I can't say that I really enjoyed reading any of the comic books uh, that I read this week, but there was at least one worthwhile point of reflection that came from reading the most recent issue of Alan Scott, The Green Lantern. Stick around and I'll share what that's about. I'm Peter Franson from ChristianGeekCentral.com and Spirit Blade Productions. Welcome to Essential Issues Weekly, where I talk about DC Comics one week after their release on the DC Universe Infinite subscription service. In each installment, I pick an assortment of comics to talk about as a DC fan and also explore what, if anything, they have to say about the essential issues of real life. Now, warning, full spoilers for everything that I talk about so be aware this is your first and only warning that many spoilers lie ahead right now we're taking a look at comics originally released to the ultra tier on june 18th 2024 all of them published may 21st except for alan scott the green lantern uh which was published on may 14th so let's go through each of these one at a time the first one green lantern war journal we're getting some insight to this revenant queen and this interdimensional evil that john stewart is up against honestly it's felt like conceptually kind of too far off the beaten path for a while now in terms of the enemy that he's up against now eventually they're tying it back to the idea of the dark stars but there's a huge exposition dump in the middle of this issue and it's just it just feels a little bit too scattered and off the rails too many new concepts that are being played around with and i really wanted this book focused on Jon Stewart to be more focused on his character instead of introducing these different interdimensional concepts, parallel gr universe Green Lanterns and a Revenant Queen and all this Dark Star stuff. You know, the Dark Star stuff, I like them circling back to that. I like what they've done in recognizing in continuity that yes, he was a guardian and kind of still is in a sense. Um, but there's been so much that's felt scattered too much. There's just too many things being thrown around. Uh, and it's felt like uh, just not really what I wanted it to be. But I am going to continue sticking with this just because I'm a big fan of Green Lantern. Green Lantern is a superhero concept, is my favorite of all of them. And so uh, they're almost always going to be able to have me as a reader. But this is definitely not the kind of storytelling that I typically like. So that's Green Lantern War Journal number nine. Next up is Nightwing number 114. This is part one of five in a new storyline called Fallen Grayson that is finally addressing the um, fear of heights that Dick Grayson has been struggling with. It started back and I wanna say, I think they said issue 107 is when it started. We started seeing glimpses of it. Now they're really going to deal with it properly. He is coming back to Gotham and uh, it, being part of like leading an event, what do you call it? Like speaking at an event for the Alfred Pennyworth Foundation, a big charity event and stuff like that. Well, this secret evil organization that's been ripping the hearts out of people uh, is starting to reveal themselves in this issue. There's still a lot of setup going on, especially in this first issue being the first part of a, of a storyline. And so, like many comics that I read this week, it felt like it was over before it was really getting to some meat and really bringing about some change and advancing the story. So that was a little bit frustrating, but um, I do appreciate that they're zeroing in on this Fear of Heights thing. Dick Grayson is also questioning his role as a hero a little bit when he mistakenly attacks someone who was running away. It looks like I think they I'd have to look at the pages again. I can't remember, but it looks like they stole something. But he mistook them as a violent criminal when they reached in their coat. And actually, they were just pulling out like this frozen meat that they'd gotten instead of like a knife or a gun, which he was so used to assuming would be the case. So it, I think there's going to be some introspect, introspection in terms of like who he is and how he thinks as a crime fighter. And maybe that'll tie into his fear of heights and the resolution of that. Anyway, so I'm, I'm pretty invested in this point. Uh, and it seems like a good jumping on point for people that are new to Dick Grayson as well, because there's an opening flashback that takes us all the way back to uh, when he was a kid in the circus and just kind of like some a formative moment in his past. So I think 114 is a good issue of Nightwing to jump on if you've been a little curious for a little while now. Uh, all right, moving on. Superman 14. This is continuing the House of Brainiac storyline, which this issue is a lot of it's a big, you know, punch out between Superman and Lobo. And I've already said before, I'm not really a fan of Lobo and the fact that there's a whole race of him that's in play now. Like, I'm not really into that. The one thing that did stand out to me 
that not in a good way was the thing that Brainiac has been cooking up and like he's going to create something. He's gathered all this knowledge, but there's something he has to do. He feels compelled. What is all of this leaning toward? And it looks like it's leaning toward him creating a Brainiac queen or something. I mean, I think that's what he called her as a queen. And I'm like, this is giving me weird, cheesy Bride of Frankenstein vibes. And maybe that just seemed like a really cool idea to them. And maybe it's resonating with a bunch of other readers. But for me, I'm like, oh, there's just one too many things here that are just on the edge of silly. And so uh, I'm, I, I, I like Brainiac as a concept, but I'm not liking this story that's really focused on him. Next up is Titans 11, where we get a new villain, v Vandine, Vandine, I can't remember what her name is. Anyway, <laughs> in the opening pages, we see that once upon a time, she dreamed of being a Titan, entered into a mysterious program that allowed her to be experimented on, and it went south, but they saved her brain. <laughs> and years later, uh, Dr. T.O. Morrow, I believe it is, gave her a, basically an android body that mimics all the powers of the Titans, and she's been brainwashed to think that her her heroes, her idols, the Titans, have been replaced by evil android replicas, and she needs to go and take them all down and rescue her beloved Titans. And so she's, it's, I think it's a really interesting premise uh, for a new villain. There's still this thing going on with Raven having been completely overtaken by a demon, and so it's not really Raven uh, that's behind the wheel. Um, I'm wondering if that would be working better for me if we just lean totally into that story instead of slowing things down by introducing this villain of the week or villain of the, I don't know, season or something. Uh, maybe this will play into that storyline in ways that I'll appreciate. Uh, I do kind of like this concept of a villain, um, but I... I kind of wanted to get this Raven story just played out and done with because, frankly, it wasn't super interesting to me. Um, anyway, I guess that's all I have to say about Titans number 11. Then we've got Wonder Woman number 9, where she's still going up against this villain, the Sovereign, and she has been captured now. And uh, as we saw in a previous issue, she was being kind of brainwashed into believing that she was a 1950s housewife with Steve Trevor as her husband, and she kind of broke free of that kind of oppressive ideology being forced upon her. But now she has gone into this mental survival state where she is choosing her own kind of fantasy. And so the whole issue is her really kind of coping with being in complete isolation, maybe even in complete darkness. I don't know if she's undergoing sensory deprivation. It really all takes place inside of this mental world. And in this mental world, she, where she's more in control, Steve Trevor is much more of an equal partner. But they're really leaning into, and I'm grateful for this, um, the relationship between Diana and Steve. Like, this is something that is valued and seen as pretty core to Wonder Woman mythology uh, in the same way that, like, Superman and Lois are. That's, that relationship is pretty core to that mythology. And Steve Trevor has not always been treated as core to Wonder Woman's uh, mythology and her lore and her story, but it looks like they're really valuing that now. Wonder Woman, certainly as a character, seems to see things that way, that it's very important uh, that Steve be in her life. But what that dynamic is, is something they've been playing with, and certainly we are dispensing with the idea that she is going to be subservient to him in any kind of like a traditional 1950s wife kind of way, but there's also a rejection of the idea that Diana would need anything from Stephen. And depending on what is meant by that, it could be a healthy attitude or an unhealthy one. In terms of what I think we see in biblical marriage, even though that's not what's going on here, I'm just trying to, to figure out, okay, what is the healthy ideal? Biblical marriage, as I see it, is this partnership between uh, a husband and wife in which they are at many times submitting to each other. Of course, there is language that ultimately leads to the idea of the wife submitting to the husband, but then also there's the idea of the husband loving his wife as Christ loves the church and gave himself up for her. So if that's not submission and self-sacrifice on behalf of another, I don't know what is. And so I think that loosely speaking, we can say, yes, there is meant to be this serving of each other, providing for each other, helping, partnering with each other. Does that mean it's healthy to need each other. Well, I think that as 
spouses, we ought to be dependable and able to be depended on, but is it healthy for us to need to depend on our spouse? Well, it depends on where you take that. Ultimately, we need to be depending on Yahweh. We need to be depending on God as the ultimate provider and sustainer and shelter and comfort and all the things that we need in life. We ought not to be looking for our ultimate sense of security in our spouse, but rather in Jesus. So there is a sense, I don't know if this is the way Diana and the writer mean it, but there is a sense in which it is healthy to to reject the idea of needing uh, our spouse, again, depending on what we're talking about there. Diana clarifies what she means a little bit by saying to this figment version of Stephen in her imagination that is a coping mechanism right now, she clarifies saying, this is not needing you being here, me conjuring you to be here. This is not needing. This is only not wanting to be alone, which of course is, is very understandable. Anyway, interesting stuff thematically going on there. I, I think I could have done without an entire issue being given, especially after the 1950s one, you know, uh, two issues like this that are all basically inside of her head. I kind of want to move things forward and have the, the situation with the sovereign move forward and get resolved. It looks like, based on the tease at the end of this issue, that she's coming out of that that uh, mental world that she's in and she's ready to, you know, see, okay, Sovereign, now what have you got? Uh, so hopefully we'll get back to the here and now and reality in the world of Wonder Woman with issue number 10, but those are all my thoughts about issue number nine. Finally, then we've got Alan Scott, Green Lantern number six, and this finishes up the storyline uh, that kind of re-establishes Alan Scott's origins, but also includes a component of a gay relationship that is really integral to uh, how Alan Scott kind of developed as Green Lantern early on, and this nemesis, the um, the Red Lantern, who gets his power from something called the Crimson Flame, which is very closely associated with the Star Heart that Alan gets his powers from. Uh, he's kind of his arch nemesis, but at the same time, uh, they were lovers at one point, and so there's kind of like some complexity in terms of how, of course, he feels about uh, the Red Lantern, and of course, as readers, how we are meant to feel about the Red Lantern as well. And there's added complexity that I bring as a reader who holds to the uh, Christian biblical sexual ethic. And so when they are kind of uh, saying that this path that Alan Scott is going down um, of kind of like discovering and then pursuing his same-sex attraction and relationships in that vein, they're painting that as like a good thing, a hard road that leads to a good thing. You know, in my mind, I'm reading the story differently. Uh, I can tell that that's how the writer wants me to see this, but I'm reading it as, man, this character is going down a hard road, and then he goes further into self-deception and takes him down a dark path. And it's hard to read a story like that when you can tell that, like, you're kind of being preached to in the, in the, in the light sense, lowercase p, I guess, in the sense that the writer expects you to agree with uh, the path he's on now that he's chosen and uh, chosen to pursue. Uh, you know, he hasn't chosen to have these feelings. These feelings came uh, as they do for, um, I, I think, most, if not all, those who experience same-sex attraction. Um, there's, of course, it's actually, that's I'm painting with way too broad a brush there. There are so many different stories, so many different situations, so many different contributing factors. But um, I guess my point is he's got these feelings and the fact that he's choosing to pursue them and uh, to act them out is treated as like a good path. And um, well, let me come back to that thread in a second here. There was one panel here. It felt, felt a little bit rushed, but like as I've been reading this story, it's like, so what's the explanation going to be of the fact that this guy had an ongoing relationship, I can't remember if they were married, but with a, um, a villain who kind of reformed and then maybe went bad again. Um, first name's Molly. And he, uh, unbeknownst to him, because he didn't discover the ad he had kids until they were adult children, and they, I think, came to him. But uh, he fathered two... Or, or, has that been retconned so that he's aware of them? I don't even know now, but... <laughs> Anyway, he fathered two children with this woman. Um, that's uh, Obsidian and Jade. 
uh, who were part of the, um, what was it called? Infinity Incorporated, Infinity something or other, and, and then eventually part of the Justice Society as well. Uh, so, like, you know, is there going to be any comment on that about how how he had this heterosexual relationship and stuff? And and they do kind of get to that eventually in this panel here. He says, for a long time, and before that, I convinced myself my interest in men like Vladimir Sokov was just a trick of the light, a way for my human mind to make sense of the cosmic bond between my emerald flame and the crimson one he embodied. I told myself a story that I was a straight man being confused by the pull of an incredible celestial power. Eventually, I realized the celestial power in question wasn't a magic space flame, but regular old love. So he's going through this process that I think uh, many gay people experience in their formative years of confusion and searching and wondering and trying to figure out what is going on with them and then what path should be chosen at some point. I have no idea what that experience is like. But I'm reminded again, I mean, this is very consistent with a number of stories that I have heard from the creators of livingout.org. Uh, I did a spotlight on this ministry uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I'll try to remember to put a link below the video version of this so that you can check, uh, check it out. I would highly recommend it. This is a group of uh, Christians who experience same-sex attraction and have chosen to deny those impulses in, in uh, favor of living out um, their lives according to God's design for human sexuality. And uh, really, really powerful stuff. But as a number of them have shared what their experiences were, it very much lines up with what I see in these depictions of gay characters and kind of them sharing their stories, that this is a a hard experience to go through whatever path you go down if if like the folks in living out you choose you know what i'm going to commit to um celibacy if that's if god does not give me an attraction to the opposite sex i'm going to commit to celibacy and devoting my time and energy to developing church family relationships and other kinds of relationships and really leaning hard into those things you know whether whether that's the choice or if same sex attractions are pursued the the lead up to that the confusion the searching um the loneliness that is so often a component um in those experiences uh, that's something that I do feel compassion for and that we as Christians should feel compassion for. Um, I think that uh, sometimes we can um, really get concerned about making a stand or whatever and digging our heels in about in terms of what the Bible says about human sexuality, that we just skip over the recognition that there is such tremendous pain and longing and loneliness and desire to be loved in those who are having these kinds of experiences. And that desire to be loved is actually the final point that I think is being made in this last issue of Alan Scott, The Green Lantern. Alan has been told by Vladimir, or yeah, Vladimir, that he actually has the potential to master time travel with his power. Um, and so he's been, I guess, working on that, thinking about that. And so he's talking to his son, Obsidian, and says, you know, if I had, if I gained the ability to travel through time, I would go back in time and I would tell myself one thing, one thing. He doesn't give the answer to his son, but in an epilogue taking place in 1941, we see what seems to be uh, the, the hands of an aged Alan Scott writing a letter to himself. As though he's gone back in time, he's writing this letter, he's going to leave it with his younger self before he disappears and gets out of the way. So what does he say? Does he say, embrace the fact that you're gay and pursue those relationships? No, I mean, I think that the writer would say that's fine and do that and, you know, be true to yourself or whatever the lingo might be. Uh, but that is not the thing that is valued most. He says, I know, he's writing to himself, I know with the world on the brink of war, you'll be looking for someone, anyone to hold on to who can help lead you through the dark times to come. For me, Todd and Jenny Lynn are and always be that someone. And those are his kids. He says to his younger self, fight for them. Make the world a better place for them. Turn your children's future into the light you'll shine to lead the world out of darkness. And if you should, from time to time, look in the mirror and wonder if a good man is looking back, that's a common part of uh, these stories, is a, a sense of guilt, of self-condemnation, feelings that are very real, 
so I think this speaks very much to a common experience. Um, if you should from time to time look in the mirror and wonder if a good man is looking back, if again you question who you are and where you might belong, if you feel alone, like you've lost your way and you're desperate for the light, just remember what? Just remember what? You are Alan Scott, the Green Lantern, and you are loved. That is the ultimate message, the heart cry that an older Alan Scott wants to give to his younger self. I think as Christians, we need to, even as we are disagreeing with people on LGBTQ plus issues, have f f near the front of our minds the, the recognition that the common desire for all people is to be loved. And we can talk about the differences in how we think that love is fulfilled and how that kind of love that we want to experience can and should be pursued. But we cannot neglect remembering that what this ultimately comes down to is a desire to be loved. And uh, we all want that. Again, a great resource, better than anything that a dumb thing that I would try <laughs> and share, even though I do my best. Better than anything that I would share on this subject would be livingout.org. Check out the spotlight video I made about them. Uh, they're a fantastic resource. Um, so yeah, my ring selection for this week is the Indigo Ring of Compassion, as you might have guessed. I actually was tired and uninterested in really making this video and talking about these comics and stuff. I was just like, yep, yep, more of the same, da 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 da, moving on, moving on, you know. But, but I got to Alan Scott. And even though as a Green Lantern fan, this has not been what I've wanted for a revisiting of, of Alan Scott's origins, I was reminded that, you know, there's more important things going on, Peter, than what you and your nerdy heart want for this comic book, you know. Um, and even when we're not feeling like it, uh, we, need to, uh, we need to remember compassion and we need to employ it and uh, turn to Jesus to help us grow in that. So anyway, I, uh, I just knew that, uh, that the ring selection this week had to be the Indigo Ring of Compassion. Um, all right. I th think that's all that I have to say about uh, comic books for now. Which of these books, or maybe some that I didn't mention that came out this week, has your attention and why? Uh, I'd love to get your thoughts and reactions, as always, in the comments below. Remember to check out ChristianGeekCentral.com for tons more content. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye. For more chat about geek entertainment, answers to your questions, and news from the wider world of Christian geekery, get the Christian Geek Central podcast today on iTunes and other podcast services.